Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, session, a collaboration session discussing remote teams and clients. My name is Tammy Gaber, and I'll be moderating this session. And we have a number of wonderful guests with us today. Uh, to start, we have a presentation by Alexandria, Alexandra Samuel, co-author of uh, Remote Inc., How to Thrive at Work Wherever. Alexandra Samuel is a technology strategist, data journalist, and author who has spent much of her 25-year career as a remote worker. In her upcoming book, Remote Inc., she uses her wealth of personal experience to help us conceptualize a new approach to working in the modern age. Her must-listen talk show uh, shows us how to thrive outside the office using entrepreneurial mind mindset and habits of remote pro professionals. A regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, <clears throat> the Harvard Business Review, the CBC, and JSTOR Daily, Samuel is a prolific writer whose articles on remote work, digitally pro digital productivity, and tech culture have earned extensive media coverage. The author of the Work Smarter with Social Media series for Harvard Business Review Press, Samuel has long experience um, helping people make effective use of technology to enhance their personal productivity. More than 5,000 students have taken her Skillshare class, Work Smarter with Your Inbox. And she was the lead social media expert for the web fueled business training program, which trained thousands of entrepreneurs across the UK. A featured expert on Google's digital well being site, Samuel speaks to both the personal and the business impact of technology in her keynotes and workshops. Samuel began her career in technology as a research director for the Governance in Digital Economy program, leading a Toronto-based research program for a global consortium of government leaders from her home office in Vancouver. As the VP social media for customer intelligence software company Vision Critical, Samuel led a social media analytics pilot program while working from home <clears throat> so she could homeschool her autistic son. And as co-founder of Social Signal, Samuel built one of the world's finest social media agencies while working out of her home with her husband and their first hires. She holds a PhD in political science from Harvard University, where her dissertation was the first comprehensive study of hacktivism, politically motivated computer hacking. Thank you very much. For the next portion, um, I'd like to introduce um, our esteemed guests, Meg Graham and uh, Tobias Fellows, who will be, you know, primarily responding to a couple of questions that um, I'll be asking to them and to the audience. Uh, Meg Graham is a principal at Super Cool. Uh, Meg is known by her clients and the studio for her critical insight and passion for design. Developed over many years of practice, her expertise is broad and varied. She has successfully led a number of the firm's projects in residential, institutional, and retail sectors, along with initiatives in master planning and adaptive reuse. Since 2001, Meg has taught design at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design at the University of Toronto, and has been a visiting lecturer and critic at architectural schools in Canada and the United States. An articulate communicator and advocate for design, Meg has contributed her expertise in volunteer and board positions that speak to her strong leadership role, both in and beyond the design community. As a past chair of the Toronto Society of Architects, Meg is currently co-chair of the City of Toronto Design Review Panel. Since 2015, she has been a member of the Board of Directors of the University of Toronto Schools. Meg received her professional architecture degree from the University of Waterloo, her BArch in 1997, winning the American Institute of Architects gold medal in her thesis year. She also holds a postgraduate degree from Harvard University, MDS, 2003. Meg is a registered architect with the Ontario Association of Architects and in 2015 was made a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. In 2020, Meg, re Meg received the H.J. Crawford Award from the University of Toronto Schools in recognition of her contributions to the advancements of school through commitment, dedication, and volunteerism, and a, life and a lifetime of significant achievements in contributing to greater society. Thank you, Meg. I'd also like to introduce Tobias Fellows, who's principal at NOR. Over a 20-year career in architecture, Tobias has led and delivered quality, award-winning projects across Canada with a focus on national capital region. He has hands-on experience across multiple market sectors, including public buildings, education, science and research, and commercial. Tobias has earned the reputation of a strong leader 
applying his unique skill set of creative design, technical acumen, and a proactive approach to project management. As a principal based in Noor's Ottawa office, Tobias specializes in public buildings, working for clients such as PSPC, BGIS, and the Canada Science and Technology Museum. Tobias leads a multidisciplinary team of architects, engineers, planners, and designers through collaborative process, developing solutions for complex purpose-driven designs, from recapitalization projects to new construction at every scope and scale. His recent projects include Les Terrassins de la Chaudière, sorry, <laughs> a sustainable redevelopment of the largest government complex in Canada, Carling Campus Project, a recapitalization of the 12 building campus in Ottawa, Ontario, consolidating operations from over 40 facilities, and culturally significant projects such as the Together House, a historic transformation project of the former U.S. Embassy into a building that promotes nation-to-nation -nation relations, reconciliation, self-determination, while casting a renewed relationship with Indigenous people and Canadians. Tobias is an outdoor enthusiast and enjoys canoeing, camping, hiking around the unique landscapes and environs of Ontario, Quebec, and the Appalachian Mountains in Northeastern United States. He draws great inspiration and meaning from design in these activities in nature, as it develops a strong connection to our shared natural environment and stories um, these landscapes symbolize. So what we'll be doing uh, today is something that we've called collaborative journaling. So basically what that means is I'm going to be asking two main questions, um, primarily to our guests, but I'd like each of you to think about uh, what the questions are um, contemplate your response. Um, there'll be, you know, music for two minutes. And when, you know, when I say go, I'd like you to cut and paste your responses into the, uh, into the chat box. Um, while this is happening, we will have our guests kind of respond to the questions, um, in particular, how, you know, their particular expertise in architecture, how they've kind of, uh, coped with, um, working from home. Um, if you have visuals that you'd like to share, like today when Alexandra shared with us the visuals in her home, if you'd like to share with us visuals of how you've imagined space, uh, please do so uh, using a hashtag on Twitter and Instagram, O-A-A-C-O-N-F, so hashtag O-A-A-C-O-N-F, um, and that way we can kind of click on that hashtag and, and we can share each other's kind of um, visual thoughts. So great, that's, um, so we'll get started with that uh, by asking our first question today. Um, how have you modified or created your collaborative techniques within the virtual environment? Okay. And so I'll ask each of you to think about that. Um, and then um, uh, I'd like, I'd like um, Megan Tobias to weigh in first. I think um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we, we realized early on is that um, uh, that we had to somehow uh, translate how we were working um, in the office to a uh, online environment. So I think really getting the getting the tools, um, the the digital tools, was obviously a big part of that. And um, recreating things like uh, storyboarding using using tools like Miro, I think was a really uh, big. Uh, development and and i think it's something that really um can develop further um uh past past working from home or uh in in a in a kind of continued way past this uh current situation it's something that i think uh it will continue to as 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 groups or people learn the digital tools uh they'll they'll just begin to kind of more integrate into our lives. I think there's the whole learning aspect to it. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Tammy. Do I... um, you may be able to tell I'm not in my home. There's, but uh, I'm at the office and I never left. So for us, uh, and a number of us never left our office um, because it wasn't, we didn't think it was possible to do it that way. And so for us, the virtual uh, working environment has been one that we've uh, built and, and uh, cultivated with our staff. A lot, like, I would say, let me think, I'd say about 80% of them are remote most of the time right now, but some of them do come in on an as needed basis, which we were always allowed to do. 
um, uh, by public health guidelines. Uh, and it's also a space that we've built with our um, with our consultants and our clients and our collaborators. Now, I use the term build, or I use the, the expression build space uh, somewhat facetiously because it's not a space, of course, and we are in the business of building spaces, spaces that move people and spaces that are transcendent and, and move the status quo. So the challenge for us has been uh, one that our staff has risen to absolutely admirably and that we've worked very hard um, and, and because we were so concerned with maintaining a great work environment for our staff and also maintaining the quality of our projects. I think Alex said it at the beginning, There's, or, or perhaps Tammy, I can't remember who said it, or maybe it happened in my head, but it's not possible to do the kind of collaborative work that architects do as efficiently remotely. Um, I can point to an example in my office right now where in particular in the schematic design phase, uh, we've had one staff member who has come in regularly for the last two weeks so that we could work together and build, he would, he's building models, he's doing, and we would have charrettes and impromptu reviews with those of us who are in the office now. So although I think there are certain aspects of the uh, pandemic work environment that we are keen to move forward with and maintain, there are others that I just can't wait to get rid of. So I think the, the key thing for me is choosing those aspects of um, what we've been doing over the last 14 months to carry forward with and figure out which ones work to serve the projects and our staff best because there's no one size fits all. And I will say that I think there, you know, ours is a social uh, practice. Uh, I mean that architecture broadly, I don't mean ours in particular, uh, but it's a social practice and it's one where that kind of joy of collaboration and the innovation and uh, interesting and uh, pushing the envelope and the status quo is not easily as easily or as efficiently going to come out of an online uh, experience or a virtual or an isolated one either because it's really the case that we're we're going to need we need to get together and we that's borne out over the over the pandemic that those those instances i miss the joy i miss the joy of that in person collaboration because it's out of that joy that we can make these fantastic new spaces for people that really push the envelope so I could go on for a while and I, I shouldn't keep going because we really want to hear from you folks as well. But I just want to put that out there as an opposite uh, position uh, and one that I think foundationally for me, there is no one size fits all for remote work. And I think the challenge will be figuring out exactly how to tailor it going forward on a professional, a, a broad professional basis and an individual practice basis as well, because Different practices work different ways. Tobias's firm probably works a little bit differently than ours, and it, it can be related to our size, it can be related to the nature of the work we do, or our clients, or some kind. Oh, wonderfully put. I really appreciate that. And I think you know what uh, Tobias and Meg have really highlighted that you know in in architectural practice, there's you know if I can kind of say there's two aspects to it, right? So there's the aspect of architectural production. Right, you know, as you're describing, like you know, the kind of schematic design phases and and just working on architecture, and that needs the kind of spatial qualities that the office has afforded, you know, in whatever respect that may be, including collaborative design. And then there's the other aspect to affirm, which is the business aspect, be that meetings with clients or officials or whatever. And I can kind of see how you know a lot of the recommendations made by Alexandra apply, I think, more to the business end of things of how. Um, <laughs> that worked on two levels, um, how that kind of applies to, you know, meeting with clients and being able to kind of really circumscribe the meeting, <laughs> uh, doing it remotely. Uh, but also I, I see kind of the, um, the importance of, you know, getting back to some uh, interpersonal relationships, but how it affects architectural design. I think, you know, even though with tools like Miro that you've described Tobias, and we're using that in teaching now too, um, but we're going back to full teaching in person in the fall because there's actually, you know, this is the best and only way to teach architecture is in person. Yeah. 
I, I wonder. I, I wonder. That for design too, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tobias. Yeah, I, I, I consider myself a, more of an analog person. Um, so for me, the transition was uh, difficult learning the tools. But I imagine there's a generation out there that you know pick up these tools like it's it's nothing, and and their abilities to communicate through these tools are going to be far more fluid than anything that uh, I, I would be able to do. And so I, I can see that um, while I really uh, in, enjoy and flourish in a, a office collaborative environment um, face to face, that may that may evolve um, as as we transition to people with better skills in in in, in that interface with the with the computer. And so I think that and and I, I totally agree that it's going to be you know different solutions for different groups. Um, in, in our uh, office, we have offices in 14, 15 different locations, and they're all at different um, stages uh, of the pandemic. So some are working, some are going back to the office already, the offices in the States, some are in uh, Ottawa and Canada, they're, they're still working remotely. So it's almost like this uh, experiment of each office, how they're handling the situation. And so I think it is to get to Alexandra's point is, is it's an exciting time to to try and incorporate those interesting aspect, aspects of what we learned during the pandemic about work life balance and and other things in, into this new way of working. And I think that's the exciting part. One thing I'd want to add into the conversation um, is really around we've been talking about working. We haven't been talking about learning. Yeah. <laughs> And I would say, you know, one of the things that that kind of osmotic learning that happens in the office, whether and so we've already talked about learning through charrette and through collaboration to some extent, although we didn't call it that. But the kind of osmotic learning that happens when you're in an environment with others is one that is incredibly important to uh, professional development and growth. And I don't mean that just for my juniors or our juniors here or our intermediates. I mean it also for those of us who are at top of the, you know, senior management chain, right? And so I learned so much from all those folks around me. And to do that on an individual basis, one by one, you know, with our 30 staff doesn't happen in the same way, nor will it ever happen in the same way. So again, I think that idea that there are different things that can work, like I think for instance, just to give a concrete example, consultant meetings work great remotely for most of them, which is to say, you know, a lot of our, some of our uh, engineering consultants here in North Toronto and to, to ask, you know, when they used to drive down here, cause we're in near High Park, uh, in Toronto, so like midtown, but west, ask them to drive down here. That that was a lot, you know, and that is time probably not as well spent as if we can do it remotely. So that's a that's one concrete example. Um, uh, I think, you know, having a materials meeting with your clients when you want to show them the the fabrics and the material, the the, the carpet and the tones and the textures and things like that. That doesn't work very well remotely at all, nor does it work necessarily in digital representation to send them that material board in that way. It's it's that kind of engagement and um, you know and, and investment and consensus building around what we do, which is again the kind of trying to push the envelope on making spaces more beautiful, more functional, and more uplifting uh, and, and trans, you know, ultimately transcendent uh, of, of the status quo or the norm is one that requires that kind of, um, you know, that meeting in person for sure to kind of, and that learning in person, that kind of, you know, yes, the water cooler chat, and we have a water cooler channel on our Teams um, app so that we can have those, but they don't happen in the same way for sure. It's more of an effort to go into that because there's less, there's less payback through it. And so it feels a bit forced, frankly, sometimes. And I regret that because it's not something that we wanted at all. We wanted it to be something that felt really natural and great and we could get back that water cooler chat and that casual conversation. But another, I'll give you another, just another 
piece from my own experience. I used to, when we hired people, when we were interviewing people to work here, I would, you know, they sometimes they say, well, what's the office culture like? And I'd say, you know, we take our, our work seriously. We don't take ourselves particularly seriously. I said, one of the greatest joys for me at this office is hearing people laugh in the lunchroom at lunch. I love hearing people talk about their experience and talk about their work and talk not about work, talk about whatever's going on at home or some stupid meme that's going around or whatever. I love that laughter. And that's the, if I were to say, what do I want to get back the most? That's the kind of, that's the kind of impromptu, that living together, that working together aspect, that space, that's the space I want to get back the most because out of that can come new ideas better than it can necessarily through an exclusively online or um, remote work scenario where you're much more in your own head most of the day and not being jolted out of it by, by a colleague. So can I, I just want to, so it's interesting hearing, hearing um, all of you talk about your experience in, in how, what you've lost through this period of time. And um, you know, it, it reminds me actually of a, a lot and, and a lot of conversations I've had about remote work, but also conversations I've had over the years with people about the transition to a digital world in all kinds of contexts. And, you know, it, it's a little woo, woo to say it, but I think part of the challenge we have in moving forward into this new way of work is that we haven't made a lot of time to grieve the loss of what we knew before. And that what happens is that there is, there's an, we have emotional attachments to how we've worked, you know, and interacted with people and we miss these certain kinds of interactions and we're focused on returning to what we know when I think we can create space by actually like experiencing the depth of the loss and then opening ourselves to ways of satisfying that in other ways. And I mean, I love the way you describe like the joy of being in a room and being collaborative that joy can return it, but it might look different. It might be that there's less time that people spend in the office, but more like walking around the city with a colleague. And maybe it's not even somebody in your firm, but it's somebody else who you're like out and you go for a walk in the afternoon and you talk about the houses you're passing and you talk about the things you've each been doing and it refills you and it gives you some of that collaborative energy and it gives you some of that inspiration, but it looks totally different from what those experiences looked like in the pre-COVID world. And I, I really can't emphasize enough how important I think it is for people like individually and possibly even collectively, like explicitly as a team to like mourn and let go of the world we lived in so that we can make space to encounter this next phase on its own terms. I think that's a bit of a... Um... I mean, Alex, I will say that in when I was in grad school, I did very much what you described, which is that I worked my own hours. Sometimes I worked from two to ten and I you know, did stuff in the morning. And and I think that again, I think there's a there's a distinction here to be made between the work that one does on one's own and the work that really benefits from the client, the the staff member, and the project's perspective from a more collaborative uh, approach and 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 one that ultimately, um, frankly, uh, is more efficient. Now I can't, you know, and and that that's the bottom line. Like I mean, let's be frank. I've worked, I, like I've worked many more hours a day during the pandemic to keep the practice moving than I would, would have when we were all here. It's just not as efficient to be running a practice in this way. And but that- It's also like having a new business, right? Like I do think there's a thing where everybody's business is a new business now. And, and the first year of a business sucks. Like we all remember year one, year two, it takes a few years to figure out your business. And in a way, I think that's what's frustrating, right? Is we all have to start from scratch. I think it's impossible to start from scratch, frankly. And I also think, and I don't think it's advisable, nor do I think it's desirable. And I would say maybe putting it in like in another brass tacks way, I don't want to spend as much time in front of my computer. And the virtual remote that necessarily means that I will be doing that. Whereas when we're working in the office, there's I, my eyes don't burn as much because I'm actually working with paper. I'm getting up, I'm moving around. I don't have to do all my interactions via this screen. I watch my son, my seven-year-old son start his day on Zoom every day and he starts going like this. 
and then he puts his head down. And it's not because he doesn't want to participate, it's because he's exhausted from looking at the screen all the time. And that's a fundamental, you know, as a practice, uh, as running a practice, I'm on this eight hours a day with people. And then I'm on this eight hour, like another three to four mm -hmm. hours doing math and business and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's really sustainable. And yeah. I don't have a way of reinventing that because I can't, and re I can't reinvent the interface. Well, and I think that is where the hybrid situation is going to be such an improvement, right? Because you can have, you can have, you know, the Zoom thing is awful, right? Like I, my hope is that once offices reopen, even if people are only going into the office two or three days a week, we really get religious about office days or meeting days. And on, you know, if I'm taking more than one Zoom call on my at-home day, something's wrong. Well, I think if, if you don't mind, we'll just take it back a couple of steps and just talk about the way we work, right? And, you know, the way architecture education, and this is, you know, I've been teaching for more than 20 years in architecture, right? The way architecture education works, and from the very first day I started school is, you know, we were told, don't work alone from your basement, right? You need to be in the studio. And what Meg talked about that osmosis is ongoing, right? You're learning um, from your colleagues. I learned from Meg. She was my TA. Um, you're learning from your TAs and from your profs, but like more, the most I learned was from my, my classmates, right? Being in the building. And that's why architecture students around the world get a desk for the entire semester or the year with a lock and key. And they're encouraged to design in the studio, even studying for their other subjects. And this past year teaching remotely, has had so many challenges. It is what Meg describes where you're putting in twice as much time to facilitate a shadow of what you did before. You know, and in the fall, we plan to go 100% back in person because we've tried Miro and we've tried all of these interfaces. And the fact of the matter is, you know, efficiency in teaching architecture, I think is parallel to efficiency in practicing architecture where you need to physically be present around in the space the creative space that's physical and you know it's analog and it's digital you know you know some of us you know Tobias you know in our generation will joke about being more analog but the truth of the matter is we need to keep alive a lot of the analog skills in our profession because you know I'm encountering very young people 18 19 year olds who you know can't sketch and, and you need an architect who can sketch that's there's there's a line here there's a line here and and teaching how to sketch or draw or think or do that happens with the kind of in person. So I think, you know, the conversation here has been about negotiating, you know, those boundaries and, and where can we be more efficient, right? There's certain things we can be more efficient. So there's certainly takeaways from all of this experience. It's not to paint things in black and white, right? But it is to say, you know, what's most efficient? And, you know, each profession is different, right? And in our profession, the proportion will just be different than, say, in business, right? And in our profession, it'll always remain where a big part of it needs to be in person and a part of it will be remote, right? And we're negotiating how to make it best in those two worlds. But I don't know, like when we talk about grieving, if we need to grieve as much as we need to kind of figure out what we want, like articulate what we want. And, and if anything, this past year has taught me the value of being in person, right? And the value of that interpersonal exchange you know, I was just, you know, at school a couple of days ago, and I just can't tell you, like, it was like this, you know, my productivity, my imagination, my excitement, you know, I really appreciate, you know, this wonderful gift we have, right? And I think just making the best of these worlds, and um, I think that's where the conversation is at. But um, I know we've been talking lots, and it's been amazing. I want to just quickly go to the chat box, uh, take a look at some wonderful feedback um, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to read a few of them. And then if you want to bounce off ideas off any of them, that would be wonderful. Um, so uh, the first question we got from the audience, just as people were um, talking, was um, Megan Tobias, can you provide insight on what we have just heard about the five hour home quiet work environment and balancing that in a collaborative, creative and highly responsive environment like architectural practice? Thank you very much. Um, there's been some reflection on Zoom meetings and, you know, learning how to keep your space decluttered, um, some reflection on, um, so specifically, Meg is brave enough to say what we've all been thinking. I totally agree. I think it's really hard to create the joy and magic of a studio environment remotely. Um, another great suggestion is take turns sketching on a shared drawing 
and take a series of screenshots that can result in some very interesting brainstorming sessions to collaborate quickly and democratically. Um, uh, another person has shared, my working process hasn't changed much from before the pandemic. I've been working on remote projects with remote teams for a number of years. The biggest change is heavier reliance on virtual meeting software and digital collaboration and drawing spaces. However, this is a poor substitute to the direct team collaboration. There is less an opportunity to advance projects through spontaneous hands-on discovery and the brilliant accidents that come from working hands-on with other people. Collaboration is very important for architects. I like the punctuated collaboration better than collaboration at all the time though, because we all need some personal time for production and focus. Uh, the collaborative design part is hard virtually, but doing of the drawings is more efficient. There are fewer interruptions. Um, so this is great, like lots and lots of feedback. I think we may be uh, getting close to time for the next question, but before we get to that, I mean, there's just been a lot shared. Um, if we want like just kind of an elevator pitch or a minute from, from Alex, Tobias and Meg to kind of reflect on this, that would be great. Well, um, I think just uh, some of the things that I I'm taking away is, is that, you know, I think working in, uh, this is a very unique time that we're, we're just working from home. So we haven't hit that uh, hybrid time. So we will eventually hit a hybrid time when we're able to recoup some of that one-on-one uh, -on -one, or not one-on-one, -on -one, but collaborative uh, in-person meeting. And I think that, that really, to me, is about relationship building because uh, you, can't, you can't replace that over, over a computer. And I think that's why we go to the office is, is really that's the, 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 what it's all about is creating those relationships, learning, um, learning through osmosis and, and building social capital. capital. What we, we've, all, we've kind of spent our social capital, I feel, over this pandemic and we're, we're all kind of like burnt out and, and, you know, team meetings can get pretty punchy because people are all at their wits end. But I think we all need to recharge and and understand why we're back in the or understand why we're working together. It's because we want it, we we enjoy what we're doing, we like the profession, and we enjoy working together as a team. And I think that will once we get past this kind of very unique point where we just have to work from home, then it will be something really new and exciting. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Great. Thank you. Alex. You're muted. You're muted. Still muted. Sorry, my cursor had disappeared. Um, well, it just—it's interesting hearing um, your, you know, there. It you're making me think about um, two or three really discrete pieces. You know, there's so much conversation that I'm in around, you know, the the necessity of returning to work or the plans to return to work in order to foster collaboration and. Um, hearing you folks talk has made me think about the fact we, you know, we just published this piece in the New York Times where we talked about the, uh, what we call the FLOX model, the five, five dimensions for thinking about how teams can work together. Um, and what strikes me, and one of those pieces is culture. And what strikes me in hearing all of you talk is that it's really useful to disentangle, you know, three, three pieces of, of what determines coming back to the office. One is just that there's a functional piece of like, it's just a heck of a lot easier to do certain kinds of collaboration live in a room on paper. Um, then there's like a cultural piece, which is, um, you know, we want to form connections and trusting relationships. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily impossible to do remotely, but it's certainly easier to do when you spend at least some time in a room. But the third piece that I hadn't really reflected on before, and, and is really clear to me listening to all of you, is that, you know, different fields attract different people for particular reasons. And, um, you know, it's interesting to hear you all talk about how deeply collaborative and social our architecture is as a field. Um, and it, it, for me, it raises the question of whether there may be a evolution in the field or like a bifurcation in the field, particularly if, if this pandemic kind of way of working lasts a little longer, where, you know, people who have maybe not been as keen on architecture because they don't like that social dimension might have the opportunity to participate in the field and find it more appealing if it's more solitary. And so I'm just kind of curious to see how not only your field, but other fields evolve in ways that 
you know, become a little more eclectic and, and less defined by whether you're the kind of person who wants to be in an office with other people. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, and, and I've got so many thoughts going around in my head, but um, I would say we're dream we dream, architects dream, architects create, and no matter how, what phase of the project we're at, we take the approach in our office, or we, we we're very clear about the fact that design doesn't just happen in schematic and DD, it happens all the way through the project. And that means that act of creation that requires what a colleague of mine has just written to me and talked about pollination, mm -hmm. that cross pollination of ideas, uh, being a pollinator between teams, uh, creating those kind of, and I'm gonna get a little bit, it's gonna be a little squirmy, but like, you know, creating those beautiful, you know, those, those like that, that act of creation, creating those beautiful flowers out of which we evolve and create our architecture is something that, uh, is what drives me and I think what drives the folks in my office and what drive and 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 watching people grow and learn and that means and and watch our clients get excited about things and and touch and feel and be and look at models and and experience that all with us in is something that I think every architect no matter and I'm an introvert uh, I'm a highly socialized in introvert according to Don Mackay Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, that you know, but but it, it doesn't. It like I dream on my own when I'm walking down the street, Alex. To your point, when I go for a walk to get a coffee, and and I I can definitely brainstorm with one of my and, and I've been doing it over the last couple of weeks. Of, um, uh, now that the weather's been good, you know, go for walks and just sort of dream about those things. But it, it that's not the only way to do it. Sometimes you can't, you're not just doing it with one person. You're going to roll up your sleeves and do it with five. And we've done it in a socially distanced way in our in our boardroom. And those are the moments that propel me as a person, as a professional, because I love my work. Um, those are the moments when I see other people, the light, you know, or like they get excited about something and you can read the room in that way. I, I can't, That that's uh, that's what propels our profession forward and what keeps the work strong and fresh and 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 thoughtful frankly and so yeah i i really think there are different um there are different there are things we will bring forward absolutely and i think like i said when we started out there are things i cannot wait to get back from what we were doing before and that very much includes you know those one-on-one -on -one conversations that i have with staff which are fundamentally different when i have them like over this thing. And when I sit with them on a bench outside my office and have a coffee. Yeah, oh. yeah wonderful put. thank you. And to kind of reflect a bit further, I mean, I've been teaching full time, you know, as a professor since 2000. And, you know, I've now taught thousands of people and um, our profession attracts every kind. So it's not, you know, it's like Meg said, you know, it's not just a bunch of extroverts, right? We have all kinds of really interesting people come and we actively work towards I'm making it open and inclusive for um, different ways and different people to um, to learn from. And you know the the my main takeaway, you know from you know teaching or one of the main things is design is not a solitary act. Oh. It cannot be a solitary act. You run the danger of ego overriding design when it is exclusively solitary. Our profession is about making a better quality of life that only happens with interaction. With the client, with the users, and with other people who design, because no matter how old or senior you are, you are learning all the time from all the people around you. Mm -hmm. And it is fundamental mm -hmm. to get a crit. Like the crit is just like, you never get away from it. You need the crit all the time. It's the wake up call, right? And you can get that crit from anyone, right? And so for me, I don't think, I fundamentally don't believe design can ever be solitary and we really are going into dangerous territory mm -hmm. if that happens but um before we you know go any further i'm gonna like try to segue to our next question and we've kind of touched on this already and i'm, I'm really excited to hear everyone's feedback on that um, so the second question for for our panelists and for the audience is when working uh, remote how do you balance work life 
So um, Alex has touched on that in her presentation that it can get you know blurry, um, move kind of between the two worlds. Uh, but I'm really keen on, on finding out from you know Tobias and Graham, who are principals at two very different kinds of architectural practices, how you have you know what your takeaways are from balancing uh, this work life. Tobias, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, um, well, it's been difficult, and it's been a learning process. Um, and it, it's kind of evolved and changed over the whole pandemic. Um, I think uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I kind of created a, a fort in my basement and, and, and camped, camped out in the basement for a while. We had the, the kids uh, also kind of these uh, kind of nomadically uh, walking around the house. Um, and, and but, but I think you have to be a lot more intentional about how you take your time. And I think that's been, that's been one of the, the, the good points, but the challenging points as well. It's because you, you can get caught up in, in the, this kind of uh, spin cycle of meetings and you really have to, um, like, like most things during the pandemic, you really have to schedule in kind of a time to yourself. Um, just as a company, we're seeing that, you know, people aren't taking as much vacations across the com uh, company. So, you know, everyone's being encouraged to take their vacation because um, uh, the, the, the rates of uh, time off are, are low. So we know that people are working <coughs> hard. And, and so I think just, just being a lot more intentional about taking the time off. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, it's, it's last summer was one of the most amazing summers I've, I've had. I, I were fortunate that my family has a, a cottage and we were able to work from the cottage and and that was an amazing time and something that I don't think I'll ever be able to recreate again, but it was, I was able to do the do the work and, and spend time with my family, you know, during the day, uh, three o'clock, go and jump in the lake. I mean, that's, I never think I'd be able to do that. Uh, in, in a work type environment, but there I was and I did it and it was great. But that's a, that's, that's a special condition. So let's talk yeah. about folks who don't have that special condition or don't have the ability to, yeah. you know, I have staff members who one told me, or told us rather, he said, I didn't rent this apartment to spend 24 hours a day in it. It's oh, only guys. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a comfortable place to be, no matter whether we have ergonomic chairs or whatever it is, it's not the place to spend 24 hours. Let's talk about we have kids at home who are trying so desperately to have, uh, to, 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 you know, to be IT, you know, uh, uh, like IT consultants and also get their work done. Now that will dissipate as the kids go back to school for sure. But let's talk about folks who are in smaller apartments who also <clears throat> don't have the opportunity to go to a cottage or don't have the ability to be in a different room from their partner just because of the yeah. size of working online. Mm -hmm. That's really challenging. And I you know in a city like Toronto, but there are other cities like this as well, you can't just say, well, go find a bigger apartment. That's not the way this is going to work, right? So I think that work-life balance and what we are finding, you know, like, you know, the, the work day bleeds, right? Some folks just end up working till seven o'clock. And, and I, you know, I, and we, we want people to have a day. We want people to have an evening. We want people to have a morning and a weekend. Today is actually a day off for our office because we're doing summer hours in the way that the Fridays before a long weekend are a day off. I've, but I've just gotten a, a message from one, I know at least two of them are working today, three, I think. And, and that kind of, you know, the, you know, the, that, that, that is a very deliberate act. And Alex, I think that is something that people can learn to do and to do better after through this process. Like we've all learned that, you know, scheduling Zoom meetings back to back is actually not good for you. We've like, mm -hmm. as your massage therapist thinks, says everybody's gluteus maximus and minimi are like gone completely, like we're all gonna have back problems very soon. Yeah. But, you know, I think that that's some, that is something that can be learned for sure. But I think that the ability, I have had some staff members tell me, I really want to get out of my house. Like I need to get out of my house. I, I like going to work. 
you know, and, and we're not able to, you know, we're not able to accommodate that right now uh, because of public, and we shouldn't, you know, because of public health measures for, for every, yes. all, we yes. can't do that right now. Um, but I, I think that's the other, you know, different strokes for different folks. I don't think that there is a one size fits all uh, for this, uh, nor do I think, you know, and so some, you know, that, that, that's really the question going forward. Like, I don't think, um, and, and I, and I also don't buy the argument that staying home so that you're working from home so you can put in a load of laundry is a good, that, that I don't think that, you know, outbalances what you're able to do at the office better, which is the kind of collaborative work and the kind mm -hmm. of innovation that you're able to do. So that, that's, you know, I, I, and I think one of the things I've found challenging through the pandemic is that the, the kind of reporting in media, the, the stories on remote work have really focused on particular aspects of it um, and not others. And so I think what we really need to have in the media and in, uh, you know, like in, in the practice is a and in the, like just generally is a larger conversation around the pluses and minuses and not just from what I've, you know, have been to me more singular perspectives. Um, which actually have, you know, changed slightly or, or have, have, have changed as more people are reporting wanting to go back to work. So I would dispute, um, Alex, you said most people, the vast majority of people want to work from home. That's not been my experience. It's, uh, it's the survey data. There's survey, there's like dozens of surveys at this yeah, point that have, not, have, all I'm saying is it's not my, well, so. and I wonder if it varies by field. Like I actually just made a note. I, I haven't seen any surveys that have broken out intent to return to work by, I mean, I, you know, there are surveys of professionals, but I haven't seen them broken out by industry. And it just makes sense, right? That there are going to be fields where people are much more keen to come back together. And it sounds like yours may be one of those. Yeah, I think in, in, in our case, we, we did some, we've been doing surveys across the company and in the early, the early portion uh, maybe the first half, people were were saying that, you know, that they didn't want to come back to work. So yes. I think that 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 number probably sounds about right for for our company. Um, and uh, yeah, but I do think I think it's a little bit different now that we're a year in. And I'd be interested to, to see that survey now because I think people are in a different spot now. Um, but just to, to get back on on uh, the idea of of the the working nine to five, I think we're we're trying to be a lot more flexible with people's um, work work times, and I think that's that's we all have different demands, and I think you know we, we all get these windows in, into our into our, our lives now in a very more intimate way. Um, we can see where we're living, we can see our families coming in and out of meetings. And so we've connected in a very intimate way, one that um, maybe you wouldn't connect in, in an office type of environment because you don't see those, the kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. aspects. So I think there's been a lot more empathy for people's um, uh, own personal challenges. Um, so that, that I think is something that uh, has connected us. It's interesting how it connects you um, in the office and how it connects you at virtually. There, there are different ways of that intimacy and connection. It's not, it's not the same way. And, and yeah, there is that loss of working in the office, but there are new, new, way, new ways of connecting, I think, in, in, in virtual. And I, and I do think that there will be, because of the skill sets that are being developed, I think we're still at the infancy of the digital world and, and, and people's Com uh, comfort with uh, co-creating in a digital environment. We've got, we're, we're using a lot of technology. So I think our company really has invested in technology and, and really looked at uh, beyond just the Miro, um, but, you know, bandwidth and, and updating mm -hmm. servers and, and tools around visualization of work environments, Revisto, where it's, it's, you're taking software out of uh, BIM and looking at things where people can co-create virtually in real time 
these are these are things that we're doing and and i like it's interesting that's something that i mean i i kind of am on the per peripheries of um but i see that you know going forward there will be different tools that are are, are deployed and and skill sets will be de uh uh, developed. What do we? What are the? As what is the essence of what we need to take forward? That's always going to be the thing. Is what is the essence of architecture? And and is it something that we're hanging on to because we're architects and and you know fundamentally architecture is about physical space. So it's kind of like a, an assault on um, who we are as a profession. Uh, this is we're kind of at the the nexus of this confronting. Uh, digital space and 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 real space. So, what does it mean for us? I mean, that's that's kind of the interesting thing of what, this this point. We're kind of getting this hybrid, hybrid in the sense of different working styles, but also hybrid as digital, uh, you know, digital twin and 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 kind of real life. So it's it's interesting. It's really, you know, there's a lot of different things to unpack there. I think. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I really like the way you put that, Tobias. Thank you. Um, so we've had quite a few comments and questions in our audience. Uh, a lot of the comments, thank you so much, have been sharing about how you're balancing work from home, how you're getting more time to spend with family members and getting to know them. Uh, so there's been some really great comments. Uh, one grad student shared that um, they found that, you know, particular courses work better remotely, such as lecture, mm. but in person, they've really enjoyed still being able to do um, certain um, certain aspects in person. And um, one comment was uh, really, I think, uh, maybe pointed towards me, <laughs> um, uh, you know, kind of pointing out that design really isn't, you know, one should do things a certain way or has to do things. No, absolutely. I, I, I take the point and, and that, you know, that's the conversation here today is each of us is sharing our different approaches to design and collaboration and and, and maybe I speak more as a pedagogue, but uh, absolutely there are different modes. Um, Meg said it different strokes for different folks. Um, but I, we did get a really great question here I wanna share with the panelists. Um, can the panelists comment on whether they think it's important to set limits between work and life? And if so, mm -hmm. how do you set those limits? Mm -hmm. For staff or for ourselves? Well, it's just, it's it's kind of left like this. And there is another question asking about um, top management. As upper management, can you discuss the potential for longer working holidays? Um, for example, spending a month in Spain, working off, but three weeks working days, but living elsewhere and the inspiration you can bring to the architecture profession in particular. So I think, you know, maybe we can take the question in two ways, Meg, and, and think about um you know uh, as staff and as upper management i mean like tobias we've been in, we've been asking staff to book their vacation um it's it's something that is um that work life balance like i mean pre pandemic uh folks when there was a deadline would say we don't have a culture of overtime here but pre pandemic uh you know if there was a deadline sometimes you know, there'd be longer working hours. I think that that's something we have to get back to. I think what we all know, like my my schedule for a week looks like this, it's solid all the way across. That's gotta stop. Like that's Zoom meetings, like, and and now that there, you know, we have some people in the, in the office as well, but my partner, who's also my husband, we both have offices because we're on Zoom all the time. So yes, Alex, I think I'm gonna stay in an office now, <laughs> but like, I don't see him all day and he's just on the other side of the wall. Uh, and that's because we're we're interacting uh, through through Zoom all the time, and so I think that 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 certainly has to change. I think that that's something we need to. Uh, that was the frog in the frying pan. Um, you know, we we kind of jumped in that, and the heat started going up, started going up, and we just stayed in the Zoom for for this whole time. Um, I mean, I want to underline that I think I like I'm incredibly. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful and I have learned a lot. One of my clients said to me, Meg, you know, I, and he's run and started different businesses very successfully. Uh, he's like a serial entrepreneur. He said, Meg, the last year has been the MBA I never took at school. And so I think, you know, 
we've all learned that uh, you, you know, that that work-life balance is incredibly, it's just as important now as it was back then. And to Alex's point, I think you, you learn new tricks, you learn new ways of, uh, or you, you have to, uh, you have to examine what we're in now and say, okay, the, the, now the ground rules and the play, the rules by which we're going to play this game are going to be different. And we're going to, we're going to dial back on certain, um, you know, we're going to say, we're not going to take so many meetings. We're not going to. We're not going to. We're going to have defined times for for email and things like that. You know all that. In it, it, it's easier said than done. I mean, let's be frank, because what we're trying to do at the same time is maintain, you know, the kind of uh, quality of the work and the engagement with our staff and that cross pollinization that my colleague emailed about. That we're trying. So, working holidays. I mean, maybe. I, it's not something I would do. I'd want to keep my holiday separate. I'd want to be able to, I want to be able to unplug. I don't want to take this computer with me everywhere I go. And yet I do, it's strapped to my back all the time. I don't want that. I want to be able to separate because that's also the time to dream. That's more the time to dream and be away and connect with my family in a way that mm -hmm. I think is the less superficial kind of way that I've been able to do it recently and that I am more torn the way that I am spending time with my children right now than I was before when I could more easily turn this thing off and not work from home. My kids, I think, will have a memory of me during this phase with either a computer or a phone in front of my face most of the time, and that's not how I want it to be. So I, I, I do think it works differently for different folks, given their, depending on their age, their situ like their family mm -hmm. situation. And I think in some way we've been talking about this, which is why I wanted to interject it with a lot of personal stuff is that, you know, I think that we can look at it at a high level and we can look at it also at a very practical day-to-day -day level, like a real life in the trenches kind of level. And I think that there's in the conversations that have happened in the media. And I think, um, you know, elsewhere during the course of the pandemic, there's been a real disconnect between those two aspects because we're just, we're in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, it's not that the real life, real time feedback hasn't necessarily been, a, that's not accessible to everybody all the time, nor have we, you know, uh, you, now's the time for 2020 hindsight. Like if I had known that the pandemic was, we were going to be working remotely for this long, we would have made different decisions maybe I don't know I don't even know what those would have been so I think you know I think we have to be generous with ourselves and generous with our colleagues and generous with the kind of whole situation and I deep down and fully believe that everybody did the best possible job they could have and I find like and 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 I and I that I find incredibly uplifting and encouraging and gives me great faith in uh, our staff and our profession and, and the world at large. I think people worked really, really, really hard this year. Yeah. And I, you know, I'd give you all a hug if I could see you. Um, and because I'm desperate to give people hugs, but I think <laughs> we're kind of in, uh, you know, our, our purpose and our, and what we do as architects. And, and that's been really restorative. If I, if I can um, follow on what you're saying there, Meg, I think, you know, your point about 20, 20, 20 hindsight is what I hope people will keep in mind going forward because, um, you know, the opportunity that was missed and it was, there's no way it could have been seized really was to think about, okay, if we're going to be working remotely, how does that need to change our practice? How does that need to change our organizational culture? How does that need to change our home spaces, our working lives, our family lives, like all of these things. And people just had to improvise all the way through. And, you know, one thing that's been very clear in our research, both in our survey research and in our interviews with people is that um, remote work is a learned skill. And um, people have takes, it takes time to figure out the way to organize your work so that you're productive. And it takes time to figure out how to organize your remote working life so that you feel comfortable about the, you feel good about the work family or work personal dynamic. And um, I, you know, I really hope that in the, in the reopening of the office that we seize that the opportunity to do that reflection and to think just as carefully about how we want our new approach to remote days to work just the way we're gonna to have to rethink the way we want our office days to work. Because 
you know, what's, what's very clear, you know, when we spoke with people who had been working remotely since before the pandemic, they went through a transition in their experience of working remotely as well, because the pandemic changed the dynamics of work so much and of family and of the world so much that it made um, overwork a bigger problem, even for those who already had a really established balance. And I mean, you know, it's very simple, like it, it's, a, it's very practical, for very practical reasons, which is like, what else is there to do except work? I mean, you watch everything on Netflix in month by month three, and then basically what have you got left to keep you busy? I mean, it, the, the problem of, of overwork is, um, I do think, it, it exacerbated dramatically by the limitations of pandemic living. And so I hope that both individually and like organizationally, as we shift into this next phase, that people do not just stick with the habits they've developed over the pandemic period, but kind of stop and think like, how do I want this balance to work? What is going to be effective for me professionally? And what is going to allow me to, you know, reclaim some healthier habits for my own working hours and my, and my um, personal life so that I don't find myself working until midnight every night? Wonderful. Well, you know, thank you. Oh, sorry, Tobias. Just maybe, time, just, go okay. <laughs> just one, one quick point is I think just to tie back to some of, some of the earlier comments and what, what we're doing is, is focusing um, on, on performance. So if, if you, you kind of uh, look at, you know, are, are, you, are, are your projects meeting their deadlines or, or, you know, are you meeting your financial goals on the projects? And and you know meeting the meeting the deadlines, then then it doesn't really matter about how much time people are, are, mm -hmm. are working because they can be if they can do their work within five hours and they're and they're meeting the project goals, then that then then uh, then that's a success and and then they can have that time to do to do what they want to do on their own time. So that kind of gets back to some earlier discussions in the presentation. I think is is looking at things from that perspective and, and allowing people to, you know, develop their own ways of working. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time. Thank you, Alexandria. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you, Meg. I uh, really enjoyed everything that everyone had to share in our conversation. And I imagine these are conversations we continue, will continue to have as we negotiate uh, the world forward. Uh, thanks again. Thanks to the OAA and for organizing this. Um, Wishing you all the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Take care. Bye-bye.